What's up, Smarty Pants? I'm Brenda, one of your cafe coordinators, and we're back with a Teen Science Cafe live stream. Before we go further, we'd like to invite you to subscribe to make sure you never miss another awesome NCMNS video. Remember to be respectful in the chat as your moderators will be keeping an eye on the comment thread and put your questions there for us along the way. Also, check out Teen Science Cafe Rally on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. We got an exciting guest for you. Our guest is an associate professor from the plant uh, biology at North Carolina State University. Her primary research focuses on understanding the molecular uh, mechanisms that plants use to uptake, transport, and utilize iron and how to respond in low iron conditions. Tonight, she'll be sharing her insights on how plants get their beautiful and bountiful colors. Please welcome Dr. Long. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for the introduction. Can I, get the, can I take this off? Absolutely. Okay. <laughs> Hi, yeah, my name is Terry Long, and um, I'm a professor at NC State, and I study plants. And one of the things that I'm going to talk to you a little bit about is photosynthesis. But before we get into that, I was told that I needed to tell you a little bit about myself. So here we go. I am a native of North Carolina. I was born in North Carolina, uh, born in Virginia, raised in North Carolina. And I grew up on a small farm in Lewisburg. And so that's where I developed a love from, of plants. And I think plants are fascinating because they do something that we can't do. They take the energy from sunlight and they convert it to glucose and sucrose. And that it is the glucose and sucrose that we actually require for our, for our survival. So we need them not only for oxygen, but also for providing food. So when I was trying to figure out, you know, where I wanted to kind of go with my life, I, I was an undergraduate at UNC Chapel Hill, and I was like, you know, I like plants. I think I want to do something outside. I like being outdoors. So I did an internship with the Nature Conservancy in Boulder, Colorado, and I found myself hanging on the side of this mountain. And that's when I realized I'm not as outdoorsy as I thought I was. <laughs> so then the next in the summer, I did an internship with Warehouser. It was a paper products company. And that's when I was started working with plants in the lab. And I was like, OK, now this is my speed, working with plants in an air conditioned environment. I'm all for it. So then I went back to uh, back, back that, that fall semester and I started working with a guy named Dr. Jeff Dangle at UNC Chapel Hill. And that's when I started working on disease resistance in plants. And so um, some of the work that we did actually ended up telling us a lot about how different genes involved in, in, in resistance actually help plants survive, um, um, survive being exposed to different fungal pathogens. So then once I graduated, I was like, ah, do I want a real job or do I want to go to graduate school? Uh, you know, so I applied to grad school, but I said, wait a minute, hold on, let me, let me try a real job. So then I worked for a company called Icogen, which is a pharma small pharmaceutical company. And about a year in, I was like, ah, I'm, I think I could get paid the same amount of money as uh, a technician as I could in graduate school. So I decided to go ahead on and go to graduate school. And I ended up working with a wonderful mentor, Dr. Sarah Covert. And that's when I uh, actually worked on something called Cranarchum quercum forma specialis fusiforme, fusiform rust. If you ever go outside and you see a loblolly pond and it has these orange, orange galls on it, then it's from fusiform rust. So I did my PhD on trying to understand how this disease uh, occurs in loblolly pond. And it's actually quite problematic throughout the Southeast of the United States. From there, I decided to come back to North Carolina. So I was at the University of Georgia. I decided to come back to North Carolina and join the lab of Dr. Philip Benfee. And that's when I really started working on what I currently work on, which is iron homeostasis in plants. Right? And so here is a picture of the plant that I work on. It's called Arabidopsis thaliana. Can everyone say it? Arabidopsis thaliana. Right, it's a small plant. It's about that bit, literally that big. And we actually grow it on plates, uh, on petri plates. And you can see there's a picture of me holding up some Arabidopsis seedlings. And on the right, you'll see plants that are grown in something called a chelator that sucks away all the iron. And so these plants look really chlorotic and unhappy. I mean, in addition to the work that I do in the lab, I also, um, so this is some of my, of my lab members that have, that have come and gone. I have some other lab members that I'm gonna tell you a little bit about their work. And I also teach uh, plant physiology. And so um, this picture on the right is showing you the model species of Arabidopsis thaliana. And we study Arabidopsis, it's probably the most well-studied plant on earth because it's a great model. It's like the mouse of the plant world. I mean, we know so much about it. We know about, about its genome. We know um, about how it interacts with other, other, other um, with pathogens. And so on the left here is a picture showing a soybean and some, some showing that some varieties of soybean are what's called iron deficiency chlorotic susceptible. 
And then there are other varieties that are iron uh, deficiency chlorotic tolerant. So they have the ability to tolerate iron deficient conditions um, as opposed to other strains. And this is really important because iron deficiency is problematic in certain parts of the world, not because it's not, uh, there's not a lot present in the Earth's crust. Iron is the fourth most abundant element in the Earth's crust. The problem is that it's not readily available. So iron will often form insoluble ferric oxides and the plants have to figure out a way to kind of deal with that uh, lack of bioavailability. And this is particularly problematic in really alkaline soils, All right? And so I studied this process in Arabidopsis thaliana because it is a member of the Brassicaceae, uh, um, in part because it's a member of the Brassicaceae family. So it's related to collard greens and, and kale and broccoli. It's in the same family as that. And so Arabidopsis, similar to other plants, what they'll do is, so here's a picture of an uh, Arabidopsis thaliana seedling. Here's a zoom in of its roots. What happens is under alkaline soil or in other conditions in which iron is not biologically available, they'll actually pump protons into what's called a rhizosphere, or pump protons outside of the root into the soil right beside it. This lowers the pH, causing iron to become more soluble. And then there are certain proteins that are right at the root surface that'll help bring iron back into the plant. And then that iron moves from the root into the shoot where it's incorporated into many different enzymes, including those involved in photosynthesis. And so one of the things I did when I was a postdoc, and it's kind of the foundation for the work that we do in my lab now is, we did what's called a mutagenesis screen, and we identified genes that play a role in iron homeostasis. One of them we named Popeye. And so this here is showing you rhizosphere acidification. So we, so we put these uh, seedlings on something that's called a bromocresol purple, very similar to what we're gonna be extracting from this red cabbage today. All right? And it is a pH indicator. And so when plants are exposed to um, conditions in which there's iron deficient, then it'll pump protons into the rhizosphere, lowering the pH, causing a glowing. You can't really see it that well here, but trust me, there's a kind of a glowing happening right around the root. Well, the mutant that, uh, that I work on called, that we named Popeye doesn't ex exhibit this rhizosphere acidification. And so, and, and because of this and other reasons, these plants don't go very well under alkaline soil in which iron is biologically available. So we study this mutant. We also identified another mutant that shows the opposite phenotype, right? So Brutus shows increased tolerance to iron deficient conditions, right? And so we named these genes Brutus and Popeye because they had these opposing um, um, uh, responses to iron deficient conditions. And plus it's a nice, easy way to remember the function of these, of these genes. Right? And so, well, you can't, it's not, some of it's a little bit cut off. And so we use a lot of different things in our lab, a lot of different molecular techniques and even some engineering techniques to try to understand what are the regulatory mechanisms, what's called a regulatory network involved in controlling Popeye, Brutus, and other well-known iron hobian stasis genes. And we collaborate with people all over the world and all over the country to be able to do these. And so um, in recent years, we've been able to really get a, an expansive idea of what's called a regulatory network in which Popeye and Brutus are involved in that help control the iron deficiency response in plants. Well, recently, you know, some of the students in my, well, the main student in my lab, we do things like um, look to see. So this is a picture of the Arabidopsis thaliana root. And this is what's called a confocal image. And you can actually see the outer edges of the cells. And this is what's called a GFP tagged protein. So we've taken a green fluorescent protein and we tag that onto the gene. And we can actually see when the protein is produced, how that changes the shape and uh, how, how the, the nuclei changes um, as the cells are what's called differentiating from one type of cell to another type of cell in the root. And so these particular images were taken in collaboration with Dr. Krenos Williams and Ross Susani. Um, Dr. Susani has created what's called the magic chamber. You look carefully, these are little tiny seedlings that are growing in this little chamber that's about the size of a quarter. And then we could actually look at these roots in the microscope and be able to get images and track how the, G the cells change shape using this GFP marker. Another student in my lab is actually looking at, you know, what happens when we take, so Popeye is actually a mobile protein. It's like, so here's another picture of the Arabidopsis thaliana root under minus iron. And here, and, and, and here we have Popeye fused to GFP. And so these roots are actually showing uh, one version of Popeye where we just see where the gene is being expressed. Here's another version of Popeye and where you see where the actual protein is being produced. And so the differences between the two suggest that the protein move. So my previous graduate student, Jury Shawar Muhammad, um, genetically modify the plant so that the protein was only showing up in certain cell types. All right, so here we have the outer cells and some of the inner cells. And so when she genetically modified this plant, you can actually see you saw differences in how the plant acidified the rhizosphere depending upon where the protein was localized. 
So that's kind of a snapshot of what I do and some of the work that we do in the lab. I also wanted to point out that I do a lot of work in terms of diversity and inclusion in plant sciences. Um, there's not a lot of people of color in my field, and I, I want to see that change. And I know that myself and a lot of other people are working towards that. So if you're interested in, in learning more about plant sciences and the work that's going on nationally and internationally, please give me a, a call or, or send, drop me an email. So now we'll move a little bit on to the Science Cafe, where I'm going to um, take advantage of some really, um, some really talented teenage, uh, teenagers who volunteered to do some demonstrations um, showing you um, how we can extract something called pigments from plants. All right, so why are pigments important? Well, first, to answer that question, we need to give you a little background about you know, what is photosynthesis. So what is photosynthesis and how it relates to mice? Can I talk to people in the audience? Okay, so anybody familiar with this image, maybe Brenda or Ryan, ever, ever seen this image where you have a plant and a candle in an, in an enclosed environment, or you have just a, a candle in an enclosed environment? What, you know, why is it that this candle is going to poof out versus, um, a can, versus a situation where you have a plant inside of the enclosed chamber? Anybody know? They were ready. Let's see. Any, any volunteers? Colin, maybe Michael. Why is it that if you, take, if you take a candle and you put it in an environment in which there's no extra oxygen being added and you put it in a, an airtight chamber, why is that candle going to eventually burn out? Why is this mouse going to die? What's being consumed by the candle and the mouse? This is like teaching my plant phys class. Like, come anyone, someone, can anyone? The guy 7991 says the plants make oxygen. The plants make oxygen, exactly. The guy, yes. So the plants are making oxygen, all right, which the candle and the mouse can use to continue to burn or to survive. All right, and so this was discovered in the mid-1770s by a guy named Joseph Priestley and many other um, people who were really interested in different types of gases that were present in the atmosphere. And so this was the first kind of seminal um, set of experiments to explain that plants actually produce a gas that can actually purify or clean the air or provide something that we actually need, and that is oxygen. And so fast forward many, many years later, now we actually know the chemical and, and the, the biochemical processes that plants undergo in order to take CO2, which is a gas, and literally fix it into glucose and sucrose. In this particular case, we're actually just showing glucose. All right, so that's amazing to me that plants can actually take the energy from light and take CO2 and literally fix it into glucose. All right, and so photochemical, pho photosynthesis is that chemical process in which energy from the sunlight is used to convert carbon dioxide and water into carbohydrates and, of course, oxygen. Didn't forget to say, want to forget to say that. And so where does photosynthesis take place? It takes place in the leaves primarily. So here you have an image of a leaf. You zoom in on the leaf. You have the epidermal cells. And in, in the sandwich in between the dermal cells are these mesophyll cells, all right? And inside of the mesophyll cells, so here's an example of a mesophyll cell, are these organelles called chloroplast, all right? And embedded within the membranes of the chloroplast are these large protein complexes. And these large protein complexes have pigments in them, primarily, uh, primarily um, uh, chlorophyll and car um, carotenoids. And so I was going to show a little video explaining this process, but I don't think the audience can hear that. So we will move on. <laughs> we will move on. And um, suffice it to say that what happens is the chlorophyll, these, these chlorophyll and carotenoids that are present inside of these membranes deep inside of the plant cells will capture that energy and then they'll take that energy and they'll pass it along what's called an electron transport chain, right? And this helps to build up ATP. At the same time, it helps to produce oxygen, right? And then that ATP is then utilized um, uh, to make other high energy molecules that can be used in something called a carbon reactions to take CO2 and to take CO2 and convert it into glucose. And so these pigments are really, really important for our, our lives because without them, we wouldn't be able to, plants wouldn't be able to make um, glucose and sucrose. So here's a structure of plant pigments. And so you may be asking, you know, what does this have to do with, you know, you know why are plant leaves green? So certain, these pigments will actually absorb 
only within a certain range of sunlight that's that's the red and the blue range right so so sunlight is like a rain of photons right so a rain of of different wavelengths of energy and those wavelengths of energy are shown here within the visible spectrum right so this is the visible spectrum other wavelengths of energy are in the radio wave and the gamma wave and we can't see them but the visible spectrum is shown here and so the pigments um, chlorophyll and carotenoids will actually absorb light here and here, the, the green light is not absorbed. That's what's reflected back to our eyes. And that's why leaves appear to be green. You may be wondering, how, why is this fall? Why are the leaves turning colors? Well, the chlorophyll is what actually makes the leaves green. But as the season starts to change, the chlorophyll starts to be degraded. Uh -oh. The chlorophyll starts to be degraded. And then carotenoids and flavonoids, which, have a, which reflect back to our eyes yellow, start to become apparent yellow and orange start to become apparent. And then as the days start to shorten, continue to shorten, and this gets colder and colder outside, then anthocyanin or reddish color pigment starts to be produced. All right, and so today we're going to be working with two talented teens and we're going to be extracting uh, one of the pigments, anthocyanin. And anthocyanin is actually produced to help, help to protect the plant from um, too much sunlight, All right? And so we're going to be extracting anthocyanin from Red cabbage shown here, Brassica oleracea, rubra, which is also related to a Arabidopsis thaliana. And we're going to see what happens when we expose these anthocyanins to different pH conditions. What happens? All right. So, first thing we're going to do, and oh, one thing I wanted to point out is that the pigments themselves, all right, so here's a picture of a, um, some plant cells. And these plant cells have been what's called plasmalized, so that what's called the, the plasma membrane, membrane kind of shrinks in a little bit. And so here you can actually see the pigments inside of the cells in what's called the vacuole. So we're going to be grinding up these samples, hopefully breaking open the cells and releasing the pigments. So if you two want to join, they're going to introduce themselves and then we're going to start working. Hi, I'm McConnell Wade. I'm a cafe coordinator. Hi, my name is Alex Vermeer. I'm also a cafe coordinator. We'll be helping Dr. Long with the experiment today. Awesome sauce. All right. So the first thing that we're going to do is you're going to weigh out five grams of your red cabbage leaves. And then you're going to chop them up and grind them up into a mortar and pestle. And the great thing is that when you do this, you should be able to do this at home. Um, if you don't have a mortar and pestle, you can just take like a hammer and hopefully not one of your mom's fine china pieces of dishes, but take something and kind of grind it up. And here we have a mortar and pestle and Makana is going to grind up. And did you want to do some also? Okay. <laughs> They're like, no. <laughs> All right. So the key thing is to weigh out a sufficient amount of material. So you have five grams. And then you want to cut it up with a knife. You want to serrate it pretty good so that when you do the grinding, it'll be a little bit easier on you. All right. So then as you do that, now you want to add in 10 mils of water to help you with the grinding. So I'll give you some water to make, kind of make things a little bit easier. So if you don't have uh, a flask at home, what you can do is just take a teaspoon and have at five teaspoons of water. That's about 10, 10 mils. All right, and so I did this with my five and six year olds last night. So um, they weren't very helpful, but they had a lot of fun. So 10 mils of water. So this is really important because a lot of um, uh, food, in terms of food science, um, it's, I, it's possible that you can use some of the extract of anthocyanin to indicate if foods are kind of going bad, if they're changing their composition, and you can use this as a nice pH, a natural pH indicator. All right, I want to put some orange, there you go, very good, put you, there you go. It's also a, way, a good way to get out your aggressions. <laughs> right, so get 10 moves. All right. And sometimes you can add sand to it that kind of help with the grinding process. But I didn't have any clean sand and I don't know who has clean sand, but. Uh... 
Awesome. Very nice. Okay. Very good. Let's see. Very good. All right. Yes. Okay. While you guys are, while you two are doing that, oh, this looks a little weird. Hopefully, we use the, we're using the right amount. Hopefully. So then you can take a coffee filter and use this as a way to um, separate out the large pieces of leaves from the actual anthocyanin water extract. If you're doing this at home, um, you may want to be careful because sometimes it can be so strong, you can maybe dye your, your clothing. So you have to be, kind of be careful with that. So let's see. Let me, let me check it out here. Very nice. Very nice. Let's see. Let me move my cell phone. Oh, yeah. There you go. So when I was a um, graduate student, I had to grind up a lot of tissue to extract DNA. So I got pretty good at this. And um, I also have a lot of um, internal maternal anger that I can tap into whenever I'm sitting down somewhere. And I can just tap into that really easily. Like, you know, why, why are these shoes everywhere? And just, just tap into that. Okay. Okay. So now, right, let's see. Let me, so now you can take this and put this here and kind of let it just sit for a second. Same thing here. Let's see. Oh, yeah. You don't have a lot to be angry about, do you? Huh? No, a lot of... <laughs> I'm exaggerating. My life's great. Okay. Yeah. Any comments on the... Is anybody still watching? <laughs> okay. Um, I'm not sure if we wanted to say that or not. So, Lakshmi says, do... Wish she had some... Uh change if the plant is rotting or going back. Oh yeah, yeah, that's lots of things happening. There's lots of, um, a lot of the cellular compartments are starting to break down. A lot of the enzymatic reactions are, are no longer occurring. So yeah, there's a lot of stuff happening. Like right now, we're hopefully breaking open cells and releasing a lot of things from the vacuole, a lot of secondary metabolites from the vacuole. So that's why you smell something here because you're releasing a lot of the secondary metabolites that kind of make, you know, like when you're cooking cabbage, that funkiness is from helping to break down secondary metabolites. I don't really like red cabbage to eat. Do you, do you like, it? I love regular white cabbage, right, but purple yeah. cabbage is like, eh. I don't know. So, okay, I think we're good here. If not, we can always do this again. All right. So now you want to take this and put it into here. Kind of carefully, do I have any? I have a spoon that can maybe help you with that too. You just want to take this, and it was 10 mils here? Look like to me. Let's see. Yeah. So you take that, and now you just want to filter out. Let me grab you a filter. This, the big pieces of plant material from the actual extract. Have you ever filtered anything out? Ever in your in your um, science classes? No. No. What what sort of science do you get? Do you take? I'm in physics right now. Ooh, not not yeah. not not like this at all, huh? Yeah, not really. Uh, can't even do any experiments in physics. Don't tell any of my physics colleagues I said that. <laughs> like there's no experiments in physics. All right. So we'll just take this. Then you want to scoop that into here. Oh, hold on, hold it. Can you get yours too? Perfect. Perfect. All right. So now what you see is this beautiful purplish color that's coming out that's being extracted. So I'm going to squeeze a little bit. I don't want to squeeze it too much like my six-year-old did and just squeeze yeah. all of the <laughs> stuff, which mm -hmm. was just going to want to squeeze it until you get as much of the, the water back out of the, out of the plant material. So now you have your extract, which you can, mm -hmm. um, for all intents and purposes, play around with. So you got to use a little bit more aggression there. Makana. Hold on. Now, if you had all the time in the world, we would just let it sit. But I'm going to just take it and squeeze it gently. Is anybody on? Did, did, any, did you think anybody actually got the instructions online and actually is doing this at home? What do you think? Um, Probably yeah. not. No way. No way. On a Friday night, no way. We're the only ones 
doing this. I can guarantee you. One of my friends was talking about going out and getting the ingredients. So. <laughs> You're just saying that to make me happy. Yeah. Okay. So now we have our extract. So maybe let's take a look at it under the, uh, what's this called? The Elmo to see what it looks like. So here we have this nice red, uh, purplish color thing here. All right, so now the question is, now we have our, our anthocyanin. What happens if we add different, so we're gonna use this one because I think it's gonna be easier to see. I think that's gonna get too wet. All right, so here's yours, here's yours. So now take two mils. So here you have a pipette. So this is, draw it up to here, that's one mil. So take two of these and put it here, 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 here and here. And then here's yours here. Same, so get your pipette. So two mils into each well. Now, if we were doing this in a lab, we would actually use a, a 24 well plate. But these are very expensive and um, frankly, I want to take this back to my lab anyway and do some stuff with it. So. But you can do this with an egg carton at home. So, okay, so yeah, let's see. That's, being a, that's a little challenging. What kind of, let's see. There you go. Hopefully that... Let's just do the top wells so you guys can see the color change here. Four, one. Yep. So maybe let's just do. Yeah. Because I'm, I'm, I'm not sure this will show up. Well, we may have to go back to this sort of situation. So just, just do the top for right now. So the next set of instructions, I don't know if the, if the audience can see the experiment. The next set was to, again, take out. Um, um, you can grind them up, filter them, which is in part one, and then add two mils to each of your wells. So again, here, here are our wells here. All right, so we have, and in your first well, you wanna add your water because that's what, what's gonna be your control. So and every time you do a science experiment, you wanna make sure that you have a control to compare it to. And then, so well one is gonna be your control. Well two is gonna be uh, vinegar, which is acetic acid, all right? It's very um, um, alkaline. I mean, it's very um, acidic. It's very acidic. <laughs> and then we, and then to the third one, we're going to add um, um, sodium bicarbonate, also known as baking soda. We have a baking soda solution that we made here last night. All right. So here we can just again take. Um, I think it's five grams of baking soda to two hundred mils of water. That's what we have here. And then just plain old vinegar. And you can use an eggshell carton. So that's kind of our setup. All right, so now let's start to do the cool part. So now this is where we use our wastewater. We want to rinse out our pipettes with our wastewater thingy. So if you were at home, you would just go to the sink and just kind of rinse things out. But since we don't have a sink here, we're going to make do. We're going to do this. So you add um, one mil of water here to it. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, five drops. Sorry. Very different. Five drops of water to your first well. Five drops of water. Too much. I'm just messing with you. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. And then you squeeze the rest of it out. Now we're going to add the vinegar to the second well. So I'll step out. So hopefully, yes, we'll see what happens. Five drops of this as well? Five drops. Very, thank you. Did you add your five drops? Mm -hmm. Very nice, okay. So let it mix a little bit. All right, now we want to Squirt the vinegar back into the original vinegar so solution. And you want to use our wastewater to rinse it out. And now we want to use the baking soda water or the sodium bicarbonate. That's there. And we want to add five drops of that as well. Now, ideally, if you were in the lab, you should be wearing gloves and goggles. So, yeah, but this was, just pretend like you're in a kitchen. Pretend like you're, so hopefully you can see the color change. Okay. 
So hopefully you can see the color change occurring. It's probably not as obvious on camera as it is to our, our eyes. Yeah, so you see like a, yeah. And you can also maybe put some into this. Maybe it'll be a little bit more obvious too. You use a clear, maybe you can do the same experiment with the clear one and see if it, it'll be a little bit more. So again, um, uh, one, one or two mils of the extract and then five drops of either the acid or the base. And remember, to, don't forget to do your control. And so if you don't have a pipette at home, which I certainly didn't when I was a teenager, you could use um, one teaspoon of water is about two mils. Yeah, that's why I calculate. Yeah, spread it out a little bit. Very good, yeah. Yeah. Perfect. Um, we have a question. Yes. So with the vinegar, um, the audience can see the red coming out. So very, it, it, I see it from here too. Mm -hmm. The color mm -hmm. change is very obvious. And very yeah. Obvious. Is the vinegar doing something to the cells? The vin so the, the, now we no longer have cells. Now we just have the extract from the cells. The vinegar is in effect doing something to the anthocyanin. The vinegar is doing something to this chemical right here to, to actually act or answers. It's changing the chemical structure of the anthocyanin itself. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, if you were doing this at home, you may want to play around with it and add different amounts of acids and bases. So what I want you to do now is what if you were to take some of it out, some of each of the top row out and put it in the second row, and then in the well in which you added the acid initially, now add a base back in and vice versa and see what happens. Or you can add a different type of acid. So here is a lemon, it's very acidic. What happens if you were, if you were to cut this and to add some extract from the lemon instead of using the vinegar? Matter of fact, maybe we can try that. You still have the, uh... oh, perfect. So what happens if we take the well, initial well, in which we had our acid and instead we added a base back to it, what would happen? So what do you think might happen? Um, I would assume it would go back to normal. Like what it was before? You've done this before, haven't you? I have. You have. You have you've done this before. <laughs> yeah. Like, well, yeah, you know, I'm the end results. Acids and bases. Yeah, and exactly, exactly. They neutral. <laughs> so now you can play around with it and see what happens when we add. So now you've got your acid and your base. What happens if you take some uh, your basic solution, which is your sodium bicarbonate, and added it back into here? I like the positive. Mm. <laughs> so now it's gradually changing color back to, because it's changing the composition again. Oh, so you're adding vinegar in, very nice. So you can also add in a different acid to where you added the basin, which is right here and see what happens. And so that kind of um, aqua, aqua color now change back, changes back to pink. All right. And so what was happening is that, I don't know if they can see this anymore, is that the structure of anthocyanin at a neutral pH, you see here, there's a hydrogen here, but no hydrogen here. All right. When you expose it to acidic condition, now you've added an extra hydrogen molecule here, and this changes the composition so that it now absorbs in a different wavelength of light, and we see um, a different color reflected back to us. We see a reddish, a more of a reddish color reflected back to us. In contrast, when you add a basic solution, you remove those hydrogen ions, and that changes the chemical composition. So now what we see reflected back to us is more of a greenish, bluish type of color. And you can just play with this like my kids did all night long, just adding different things in and 
And so this is, um, and so similar, similar types of pigments are found in flowers and they help to make uh, flowers very delightful to our eyes. But pigments are also being, have also been used for many, many years to create natural dyes, right? And so um, many indigenous populations still use them today to create natural dyes. And so I had a video here at the very end where I was gonna show that um, there are students at the Textile Institute of, I can't remember what the institution is because you can't hear it. And so this student is actually making a natural dye. So here she's taking turmeric and she's added a few things to turmeric to actually extract out the pigment. And then she adds silk to it and the silk will actually absorb the, the, the orange color and make it orange. And so there's lots of chemistry involved in natural dyes. And so she, what she's shown here in orange is the turmeric, but um, she's also doing some dyeing with purple cabbage, just like we've done. And then she also uses something called cochineal, which is a type of insect down on cacti and extracted out purple from that. And you can make these nice lavender color material and this nice purple material that we see here. All right, so um, unfortunately you can't hear it, but if you are online and you wanna look up natural dyes, there's lots of information about it and you can do it in your own home. Any comments, thoughts? Questions. That was cool. Partners in crime. Yeah. Uh, so Why did like turn like all red? Because I added. You added a bunch of. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and then you could always add, you know, mm -hmm. uh, baking soda back into it yeah. and then see what happens. Where's my baking soda? Mm -hmm. I'm just add it back in. It's just baking soda. Yeah. Oh, sorry, 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 sorry. Well, she's doing it. She's, she's good. She's good. Yeah. Yeah, she's adding different. Yeah, yeah. And you can see it go back and forth, back and forth. Lakshmi had a good comment in the chat. Okay. I'm assuming the lemon will have less of a color change than the vinegar since it's less strong. Uh, you know, I don't know the difference between but yeah, she's probably right. I don't know on the pH scale that it more the which is mo the most acidic. But if that is true, then yes, she's actually right. You would expect that. Like if you would add a really really base, like I think milk is basic. You might see a, a weaker change than you would see with sodium uh, sodium bicarbonate. Um, you could also add something like an oven cleaner, I think is really basic. So there are different things that you can play around with at the house after you extract out the pigment. And you can also, theoretically, you can do this with uh, fall leaves. I haven't tried it with fall leaves, but, um, you know, if you, you had a hankering, you could try that. Or um, I also hear that blueberries is a, a, good, a good example, a good, a good thing to use as well. Mm -hmm. So that's all I have for the demo. I wish we could all be here in person. Maybe one day we'll get to do this in person one day. Well, with you then the audience. I already doing yeah. it with you too, so, you know. So I think that's all I had. What are you, any questions from you two? And sometimes it, re it releases a gas um, in the reaction itself. I think it's from the exchange of the hydrogen onto the anthocyanin color. And back and forth. Change you change all of them. <laughs> you change all of them back to pink. <laughs> yeah. Is asking, is this edible? Uh, lemon plus water. I don't think. Yeah, I think it could be. Yeah, because you're just taking purple cabbage and adding lemon to it. So yeah, it would be. Yeah, yeah. I wouldn't do it with the. Uh, probably wouldn't be as tasty. <laughs> but um, but like for example, I mean, it's really important. It's like the the changing of color like in canned vegetables has a different color because of the acidity or alkalinity of the solution um, when you cook purple cabbage it's going to turn blue because of that same type of thing you're changing the structure of the anthocyanin and you're eating that so um, i mean chemical reactions are happening in our food all the time one of the things we had meant to do for this demo was to take a, a apple and to apply lemon to it and see what happens with that but we forgot to do that so so that's another chemical reaction that's that's occurring that's causing that brownish color to occur and um the acidity from the lemon will prevent that from happening so a lot of food so that's what food science is all about is understanding the chemical what's happening chemically with food um because it's um that changes how we, the color of food and how palatable it is and how long it can be stored, how those, how the cell is breaking down and, and all of those things kind of contribute to the quality and the longevity of our food. So, so this is applicable to, to the, like, if you're, we're making a nice fruit salad or something, you or making a, 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 a fruit salad, you might want to add lemon to it. And when you do, you want to think about, oh, we learned about this in teen science. Why would we add 
lemons or why would we you know do something to an apple so <laughs> so yeah the pigments that um and so I also wanted to point out that the pigments that are produced by flowers are not just involved in, um, so they're not really involved in photosynthesis. So the chlorophyll that we talked about and the carotenoids are involved in photosynthesis. And the anthocyanins are involved in protecting the, the plant from too much sunlight. But the pigments that are found um, in leaves, uh, the pigments that are found in flowers mainly play a role in attracting insects um, so that, uh, for pollination. And then um, in some cases, and some think that the anthocyanin that's produced in plants um, also may play a role in repelling insects as well. So the pigments have different, may have different functions. Yeah, that's in it for now. All right, we're yeah. gonna start asking some of the questions that were put in the chat and otherwise. So we have a question from, uh, Tejas, he asks, how do other acids and bases affect plants? Yeah, so, so acids and bases. So like, for example, if you were to grow this red cabbage in the field, you see the same sort of thing happening. So, um, or if you were to, like, um, there's a plant that we were talking about the other day, um, hydrangea, same thing. If you grow it in acidic soils, then you will see a different color than if you grow it in basic soils. But one of the most important things that, uh, that occurs in terms of acid acidity control uh, causing reactions in plants is what I was telling you about before. So plants will change the rhizosphere, they'll pump protons into the rhizosphere. And this is really important because of something called soil um, cation exchange capacity. So soil has a negative charge, right? And soil is attracted to positively charged ions, right? And so when, when, so when plants pump protons into the rhizosphere, this changes that dynamic and changes the availability of minerals um, and facilitates mineral absorption. Uh, pH also plays an important role um, in, so like for example, there's a certain pH that's occurring inside of the plant cells versus outside of the plant cells. So the number of protons on the inside and outside of a, of a cell play an important role um, in controlling how certain things like proton pumps um, function or, or change the activity of how um, certain electron transport processes occur. So the, the pH inside of a cell is really, really delicately balanced. It's really, really important. And it plays an important role in um, controlling what goes into and out of the cell. But it's um, also important in, um, like I said, um, eventually in controlling color and nutrient absorption. So pH is, I can't stress how important that is in terms of plant physiology. All right. And then we have another question that's asking, can this experiment be used for any leaves or plants? Yes, it can. Per red, um, red cabbage is the easiest thing to see the color change. It's a little bit more difficult to see it with other, you can do it with blueberries is another good, red uh, onion I hear is very good, but you can do it with you know, just picking up a grass and, 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 and checking to see, extracting out. When you, but when, you, when, you're, um, when you're doing this with grass, you're mainly going to be extracting chlorophyll. And it's a little bit more different, difficult to see a color change when you add acids and bases to chlorophyll. So the, probably the better one to use is something that's producing an anthocyanin where it causes a clear biochemical change that changes what's absorbed and what's reflected back to our eyes. But yeah, all plants have pigments. Those pigments play a role in photosynthesis for all plants. Okay. And so, um, uh, all so anthocyanins are mainly produced in, in things like blueberries and, and red cabbage. And in plants, in other plants, anthocyanins are produced, as I said before, uh, mainly as the seasons change and it starts to get colder. They can also be produced in plants when plants are exposed to stress conditions. So like too much light, anthocyanins will be produced. Then you can do that extraction. All right, we have a question that's asking, adding on to the previous question, do acids and bases affect the growth of plants? Absolutely, yeah. So if, if you have, so because of the reasons that I described before, um, how the plant has to really maintain this delicate balance of pH inside and outside of the cells, um, if you don't have a sufficient pH balance, then the plant, all sorts of things are disrupted. Um, so what's called the membrane potential. So inside of our bodies, inside of the, the cells, there's a certain number of ions on the inside and the outside. And the, and, and the pH, the number of protons, helps to control that. 
if you don't have that balance, then you can't, then the cell can't function properly. And so eventually it can lead to cellular death and eventually the plant will die. So if you were to go take your favorite house plant and add vinegar to the plant, eventually it will die because you're breaking down those membrane potentials. All right, and you're also affecting how the plant can absorb nutrients because of that cation exchange factor that I mentioned. So yeah, it's really important to not water your plants with, you know, <laughs> vinegar, stick with water, trust me, stick with water. Yeah. <laughs> All right. And then we have another question that's asking, what kind of impact is climate change having on the chemistry and process of photosynthesis? And what are scientists focusing on in studying this? Yeah, so climate change is playing a really important role in terms of, so one of the enzymes that's affected by climate change and, is rubisco. And so it changes the ability for plants to basically fix CO2. And so the change in, in temperature is affecting the ability for plants to, certain types of plants, C4, what's called C4 plants versus C3 plants to be able to fix CO2. And so when you have um, global warming, then you're actually changing it so that certain plants do a little bit better than other plants. Um, and so the, one of the reasons that temperature is, is important is because like membrane, the membranes themselves have to be at a certain temperature in order for the membranes to remain flexible enough to, to function properly. Um, so that's one of the reasons why uh, temperature is really important, but also because of certain enzymes function at a certain temperature and that change in temperature changes the ability for enzymes like Visco to function and uh, fixing carbon. Um, so that's a really, so people are doing things like, um, like, so I know at Duke, they have the FACES project where they are um, changing the temperature to see how that affects carbon fixation. Um, so they basically will have a big area of plants and then they'll um, enclose it so that you get the, a warming in temperature and seeing how that affects the CO2, O2 ratio and how that affects rubisco and, and, and functioning of enzymes involved in photosynthesis and other processes. But another thing that's affected with temperature is the stomatal pore. So, they're, so the leaves themselves have these little mouths Right? And these mouths open and close in response to temperature, in response to drought. And so the temperature, the higher the temperature is, the, the drier the atmosphere is, and, and the more plants have to kind of struggle to, um, to maintain the amount of water in the plants. And so the plants will transpire, and this actually can cause really big problems. So understanding how does the model pour changes in response to drought. Um, in response to changes in the temperature is another aspect that people are spending a lot of time working on. All right. Um, we've got one more question. It says, mm -hmm. do different colors change how the plant interacts with animals, such as attracting pollinators or repelling predators? Yeah, no. So the, one of the first things that plants do in response to being chewed on by an insect is that it will release certain secondary metabolites from the vacuole. And those secondary metabolites can either physically damage the, um, damage the actual pe uh, pest or they can make it so the pest, or the pest is, I don't like that taste, I don't like that taste. So like, for example, um, um, certain, I can't remember which nut, certain parts of certain plants will produce actual cyanide. And so that's a classic example of a secondary metabolite that's produced that can actually help to, to bother the, 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 the pest and help to prevent um, um, herbivory. Um, so yes, the plants will produce certain things um, to, to kind of push away its, its, its attackers. Um, the pigments also play an important role in, like I said, attracting certain pollinators. So certain pigments and certain colors that the leaves will produce are actually even beyond our visual so we can't even see them, but the, but the insects can. And so that attracts certain insects toward them so that they can pollinate and kind of spread pollen more broadly. So pigments play an important role in, in that as well, as well as um, helping to protect um, plants from too much light exposure. They can also act as like a sunscreen. Yeah. All right, and then we've got a question for you. Uh, what is your favorite type of plant and why? Well, my favorite plant is um, a rabbit opsis thaliana because it's uh, what we what we study. Um, my other favorite plant is uh, I do like jade plants, although and I love orchids, but I, they just 
I have a lot of plants in my house and the orchid is the one thing that I cannot keep alive. It's so frustrating. I keep buying them in the hopes that they'll survive one day. I don't know. Do any of you have or if anybody knows how to I know uh, Tom Wentworth, one of our one of my colleagues at NC State is really good at orchids. And I'm embarrassed to talk to him about this because I'm a plant biologist. So <laughs> you'd be surprised how many plant biologists do not grow plants and, and are not really liking plants in their house. You'd be surprised. I'm one of the, the ones that who do like plants and one of my favorites is orchids. I do love orchids too, but they are pretty hard to keep alive. Oh, it's like, it's like a, you have to be, it's like a certain person is an orchid person. It's like, you know, yeah. if they speak to the orchids and I am, I'm more like a philodendron, like the, like the plants you, like the iron plants, the plants you see at the mall that no one cares about, like I can grow those, no problem. You know, the ones that kids are like kicking over and throwing gum in, I can do those, but the orchids, no, I, I'm not very, very good at it, but all right, yeah. and then we've got one more question from chat. What parts of the plants do the acids and bases affect? Yeah, it's almost all parts of the plants. Um, so, yeah. so the acidity, like I said, so all cells in the plant have a membrane potential and that acidity has to be made, that, that, that balance of pH has to be maintained in, in all cells. Um, but it also affects what's happening outside of the plant too, because like I was saying, it affects the ability for plants to absorb nutrients by changing the pH around the soil and changing its cation capacity. So pH uh, plays an important role in um, opening and closing certain transporters that are involved in bringing in nutrients from the soil and um, transporting those nutrients up into the plant and, and, and putting it into the leaves. So um, the pH is important throughout the plant um, and so that's one of the reasons why you have to be really careful in making sure um, that plants are grown under, um, you try to keep them at a certain, so like, for example, in the Arabidopsis, uh, the little peachy plate that I showed you, we try to keep the pH around 5.7, um, 5.6, uh, because if you, if you change that, then that changes the ability of it to absorb nutrients. And so um, that's one of the reasons why pH is so important, but it's also important internally inside of the plant as well for controlling um, what's happening at the membrane interface. And yeah, and a lot of enzymes will only, uh, yeah. So yeah, it's all over the plant. All right, we're gonna have one last question. Sure. Um, what kind of innovations or new technologies are being used in your field? In my field? Uh, oh my gosh. It's like a new technique coming out every day. So I guess one of the newer ones that I know is something called scanning correlation fluorescence spectroscopy. Basically, it's a, a way to some of the, so you remember some of the root images that I showed you where you could actually see the cells? Well, we can take the GFP signal and we can see that GFP signaling traveling across cells. So that's one of the newer technologies. There's newer mathematical equations uh, and um, ordinary differential equations and other uh, machine learning approaches and neural networks, a lot of engineering approaches are now being used to study um, biochemical and molecular processes in plants, some of the newer things that, that's happening. Um, lots, of, lots, of, lots of things happening with, um, for example, protein structure, lots of new techniques in terms of being able to study and identify and understand protein characteristics. Um, lots of things going on with uh, biofuels, people trying to modify certain metabolic pathways um, to change the, uh, the availability of, of, of biofuels in plants. Um, a lot of things going on with um, disease resistance, trying to um, understand disease resistance, a lot of efforts to try to genetically modify plants using CRISPR. So that's a new kind of a newer technique that every, a lot of people are using to try to knock out, knock out certain genes um, to try to understand gene function. Um, yeah, that's, I'm sure there's many, many, many others. And I'm sure my colleagues are like, Terry, you didn't mention my favorite new technique. And I just can't run off the top of my head. So um, a lot of um, imaging to like spectral imaging. So being able to see what sort of wavelengths of light uh, plants absorb and what's reflected back in whole like fields. Um, um, like aerial imaging is a big is a big thing now to try to see how whole fields are, are changed in response. Uh, so like, for example, you can have one patch of a, of, a, of a large acreage, um, kind of slightly alkaline or slightly acidic or slightly elevated or the soil slightly different. And so being able to image 
what how the lights reflected back from the leaves using um, spectral imaging and photography is is a new field as well. So it's um, um oh gosh, micro acro. Yeah, I can't think of the name of it off the top of my head, but lots of effort in, in that. And so if you're interested in learning more, you can visit the plant uh, the plant microbial biology website and kind of find some of the newest kind of innovations uh, that people are doing. NC State's a great place to learn more about that. Um, so we have lots of departments, horticulture, plant microbial biology, crop and soil science, um, ag engineering, who are really doing things at the cutting edge. I'm just one faculty. <laughs> so I know my area and I, and I collaborate with people outside, um, but um, a lot of, if anyone wants to know, learn more about um, what specific faculty you're doing, please feel free to contact faculty. I'm always happy to, to talk with students and try to eventually bring students like these two young ladies into their lab to do research um, and to continue to move the field forward. All right, that's all the time we have for questions. So we're gonna move on to the next Catholic coordinator. Um, hi, thank you again, Dr. Long, and thank you all for watching. I hope you were amazed by everything you learned today. We would also like to thank the museum's digital media team for helping put on the cafe. And don't forget to follow Team Science Cafe and mention us on Twitter, Facebook, and tag us on Instagram. Also, please use the QR code on the screen or go to this link that I will put in the chat. There you go. Um, to complete our survey, the survey will be sent out in a follow-up email that you registered with. Uh, completing the survey enters you into a drawing for a $10 e-gift card of your choice to Amazon or Starbucks. So be sure to complete the registration form and tune in for next month's cafe on Friday, December 3rd with Dr. Jessie Tenenbaum to learn about her research on utilizing data standards and electronic health records to target mental health disorders to enable precision medicine. She's also interested in ethical, legal, and social and social issues around big data and precision medicine. That's the word that I forgot. Precision agriculture. <laughs> Another hot topic. Thanks for joining tonight's Thanks for joining tonight's Teen Science Cafe. Make sure to hit the like button and the subscribe button and hit the no notification bell so you don't miss any more any premium content from the NC Museum of Natural Sciences. Don't forget about filling out the cafe sur survey because your feedback matters and you'll be entered into the gift card drawing. My name is Rayon and these have been your cafe coordinators. Stay safe this November and have a plentiful holiday season. We hope you have a fantastic fall and we can't wait to see you next month. All right.